We are live. Hello, uh, good evening for those of you in the United States and good morning for those of you in Japan. Uh, we'll begin the webinar in just another moment or so. Uh, so please uh, stay tuned. Uh, we'll begin very shortly. Thank you. David, I'm going to go ahead and begin. Um, we're looks like we have about 110 participants thus far. So I'll go ahead and start. Sounds good. Okay. Well, hello to everyone, and another good evening to those joining in the U.S. and good morning to those joining from Japan. We're excited to welcome over 300 attendees on both sides of the Pacific. We hope that you have had a great start to Golden Week. And of course, we wish you safety and health during this uncertain time around the world. Our hope is that this program will inform you and provide at least a small sense of normalcy. In our current global situation, it is essential that we continue to communicate across borders and cultures. And our program this evening or this morning is a part of achieving this goal. My name is Paul Pass, and I am the Executive Director of the Japan America Society of Dallas-Fort Worth. We are celebrating our 50th anniversary in 2020, and if anyone wishes to share this event on social media, please tag us with the at JASDFW handle or hashtag JASDFW50. Before we begin, I would like to thank David Jaynes, who will serve as tonight's moderator, for his vision, knowledge, and organizational expertise. Please note that this webinar is on the record and will be recorded. It will be uploaded to the JAS DFW YouTube channel, and the link will be shared with all attendees via email. If you would like to ask a question during the program, please use the Q&A function on the bottom of your screen. We encourage you to ask early since we may not be able to address all questions. This chat will be, dis the, the chat function will be disabled for attendees. Now to begin our program is David Jaynes, who will serve as the event moderator. He is Senior Advisor to the President for Institutional Development at the Okinawa Institute of Science and Technology Graduate University, known as OIST, and Managing Director of the Okinawa Institute of Science and Technology Foundation in New York. He leads OIST's strategic development efforts in the US and Japan, assists OIST in fostering relationships and building networks with leaders in US-Japan relations, scientific and technology focused foundations and cutting edge corporations in both countries. And he provides strategic advice to OIST president and senior leadership. A full bio is on the Japan America Society's website if you would like to read more. Please join me in welcoming David. Thank you very much. And I would like to extend my welcome as well to everyone joining us this evening from across the US and Japan, and also to the panelists who are lending their time and expertise to help us understand the impact of COVID-19 on higher education in the United States and Japan. I also wanna thank Paul Pass of the Japan America Society of Dallas, Fort Worth for his leadership uh, and for formulating the concept for this evening's event. In addition, I would like to thank his stellar team at the Japan America Society for all of their assistance in arranging this webinar. Before I introduce the panelists and jump into tonight's conversation, we would like to engage the audience in some poll questions pertaining to this evening's subject matter. So I'm going to launch a poll uh, that all of you should be able to see now on your screens, uh, asking you for your own thoughts about fall 2020 university conditions uh, in the United States and in Japan. Uh, do you think universities in the US will be open for on-campus students in the fall of 2020? Yes or no? 
do you think universities in Japan will be open for on-campus students in the fall of 2020? Uh, and we're receiving a lot of uh, results right now. I'm going to leave this open for about uh, five more seconds. Uh, and now I'm going to share uh, these results with all of you. Uh, pretty equal in the United States, almost 50-50. Uh, and in the case of Japan, a majority of you think universities in Japan will open uh, for on-campus students in the fall of 2020. Uh, we have a second poll that we would like to ask because we know many who are on the call uh, with us uh, have an interest in study abroad, especially between the United States and Japan, but probably globally as well. Uh, when do you think that study abroad will return to pre-COVID, uh, for example, 2019 levels? Uh, and the options here are this fall, 2020, spring of 2021, not until the summer of 2021, not until the fall of 2020, 2021, or not until 2022. And interestingly, so far, 37%, uh, uh, which is the largest percentage, is saying not until 2022. I'm going to end the poll and uh, share these results with you. Uh, so it certainly looks like the fall of 2020 uh, according to the thoughts of most of you, is uh, not going to be a time when this uh, uh, returns, um, but perhaps sometime in 2021 uh, or 2022. So thank you for participating in that. Uh, now, what I would like to do is give you a brief introduction of our distinguished panelists for this evening. Their full bios are on the Japan America Society of Dallas Fort Worth's website, so uh, I will be somewhat brief. Uh, but I would like to let you know that we are joined by three distinguished educational uh, leaders. Uh, Dr. Richard C. Benson is the fifth president of the University of Texas at Dallas, a young university of very high research activity that is growing rapidly in size and stature. Between 2007 and 2017, according to the Chronicle of Higher Education, UT Dallas was the nation's second fastest growing public university. Uh, Dr. Benson earned a Bachelor of Science and engineering degree in aerospace and mechanical science from Princeton University, a master's degree in mechanical engineering from the University of Virginia in 1974, and a doctorate in mechanical engineering from the University of California, Berkeley in 1977. He's also received three significant honors from the American Society of Mechanical Engineers, uh, including the Henry Hess Award, which honors a research publication by a young author, and he was made a fellow of the American Society of Mechanical Engineers. We also are joined this evening calling in from Japan where it is uh, morning right now, uh, joined by Dr. Uh, Robert Bachman, who is the Executive Vice President for Technology Development and Innovation and Vice CEO at the Okinawa Institute of Science and Technology Graduate University, OIST. Professor Bachman trained in chemistry at Harvard University, was a faculty member in the neurobiology department at Harvard Medical School, and was appointed associate director of the NIH National Institute of Neurological Disorders and Stroke, where he was in charge of a broad range of scientific projects. In 2007, he became vice president and executive director of the OIST Promotion Corporation, where he guided the development of the Okinawa Institute of Science and Technology from design and construction of the campus and laboratories to full accreditation as a graduate university which took place in November 2011. Professor Bachman served as the first provost of OIST. And I should note that the Okinawa Institute of Science and Technology Graduate University is one of Japan's newest universities and completely international in nature with students from over 50 different countries. And this evening, we're also joined by Dr. Harold W. Stanley, Vice President for Executive Affairs and Distinguished Chair in American Politics and Political Economy at Southern Methodist University. Professor Stanley came to SMU in fall 2003 from the University of Rochester, where he had served as the chair of the political science department. He began his career at Rochester in 1979 and served as a visiting research professor at the University of Alabama. And he holds a PhD in political science from Yale, a master's degree in politics from Oxford, and a bachelor's degree in political science from Yale. He was a Rhodes Scholar and studied at Oxford from 1972 to 1975. So I think you can all uh, see that we are uh, joined this evening by an incredibly uh, distinguished group of individuals, and I thank all of them for being with us uh, tonight. So I'd like to jump in, and where I would like to begin uh, is by asking everyone on the panel to just give us a, a quick sense of what's going on on their campus uh, now. Uh, what's the situation right now at your university? 
uh, what's the status regarding COVID-19 and how is it impacting your operations? And I'd like to turn this over first to uh, Dr. Benson. Uh, th thank you, glad to address it. Uh, I, I'm marveling at the fact that we have Princeton, Harvard, and Yale represented on the panel. Uh, we, we all seem to be getting along just fine. Uh, that's a good thing. So, um, you know, the, um, UT Dallas, of, of course, is, you know, we, we've closed down the campus as pretty much every uh, American university has. We started uh, thinking very seriously about this uh, back in January. In fact, uh, Dr. Stanley and I had any number of calls uh, around that time to sort of compare notes and to think about what our, our two universities might be doing. So we, we did a couple of things. We, we extended spring break by an extra week. It just bought us a little bit of time. And that, that extra week was really valuable because when the students came back, we had moved every last one of our courses online. So we, we have finished out the semester. In fact, we were pretty much right to this day is, is the end of classes. So we, we moved all of the remaining four weeks of the semester uh, into an online format and it worked, uh, it worked quite well. Also with guidance from the UT system, we're part of a larger system, we were asked to essentially vacate campus, uh, except for those who couldn't leave. So we asked our students uh, to leave the residence halls. Now, if they didn't have a good alternative, uh, we, we allowed them to stay. Uh, but uh, for those who could leave, we, we, we asked them to leave. Um, we have a great many students from, uh, from other countries, most notably India, and then uh, also a sizable group from China. For, for many of those students, they just had no option of returning. Uh, so, you know, they, they remained on campus. But we've had uh, very good protocols uh, for social distancing and the like. We've closed down our, our, our research labs, although we can still do a lot of research. There's a lot of data to be analyzed and, and the like. I, I should also tell you that we've broken this, this issue down into three pieces. I, I just, you know, without much imagination, call it phase one, phase two, and phase three. But we have a task group that, that looks at uh, all aspects of, of phase one, which was to, how to close down the campus. And we're now asking those groups, things like um, you know, academic continuity, facilities, communications, and so on. But I'm asking them now to think about um, coming back to campus in the fall and what that would mean. And I've broken down a, a phase two and phase three. Phase two would be pre-vaccination. Phase three would be post-vaccination. So in other words, what can we do to come back to campus? How can we do it? Clearly, there'll still be a very sizable component um, in online education, we, we will have to have it. For example, we could have a great many students who have uh, matriculated, they've been admitted to UT Dallas, but they simply can't get here. Or because of social distancing, we can't put 300 students in a 300 seat uh, classroom. So uh, we will have substantial amount of online education, even if we come back to campus. And then uh, we have a phase three, which uh, is post vaccination. Some people would refer to this as the new normal. Um, and, and I want my folks thinking about the new normal because in some ways it's more inspiring. Uh, what we're doing right now is trying uh, awfully hard to, to, you know, not get ill, you know, not, not die. And, uh, you know, you, well, there's motivation in it, whether or not there's inspiration in it, that's another matter. But by looking further down the road, you know, how can we come back to campus safely in the fall? And then when the disease is behind us, how, you know, how will we define our university going forward? So th these are the things that we're working, working through right now. Well, thank you very much for that. And uh, I think it would be great to turn it over to uh, Dr. Bachman, uh, who's calling in from Japan and get a sense of uh, what's the situation like uh, in Okinawa uh, and in Japan right now. Uh, does OIST also have some sense of these phases uh, that Dr. Benson mentioned? Uh, yeah, thank you very much, David. Yes, uh, obviously we have to deal with the, uh, the same general uh, path of this whole uh, undertaking. I, one comment I would make is uh, that we are a little closer to Wuhan, China than Texas or the US. And so actually we had a kind of early alert uh, as, as others have, uh, Richard described. And um, we prepared in a couple of ways. One, we're a PhD only university. So it was actually quite easy for us to shift to essentially an online, uh, not face-to-face -face, uh, teaching environment. But then secondly, 
we anticipated what would happen regarding not only the research on campus, but the administration of the university. And uh, we defined quickly classes of experiments that had nothing to do with COVID, but they were long-term ongoing experiments and just decided they would continue. That we would make arrangements for anything that would be se severely disrupted in terms of long-term efforts and uh, establish that. Then a second uh, category, as I said, was administration. And early on, we had already made a decision to provide laptops instead of desktops for almost all of our people partly with this kind of possibility in mind. So we've actually been rather successful, I'd say, at moving our administrative activities off campus under a work at home, not instructed leave and don't do anything uh, environment. So uh, it's, uh, there's a, a considerable amount of uh, function of the university that's able to continue under these conditions. And we have the usual, uh, whether it's, uh, Microsoft Teams or Zoom or whatever the products may be, ways of communicating. So, and then the, the third category is COVID related. So we have a modest number of projects, um, some of which are very community oriented, some of which are cutting research uh, related. And uh, we're, we're keeping those going uh, to some, in some cases basically within the university, but in many other cases, working closely with the local authorities uh, here and uh, in the prefecture of Okinawa. Throughout Japan, uh, I think it has, it has had a, a tremendous impact. Uh, and one of the things that would be a little surprising is that Japan is, is less IT based than you might think it would be. So a lot of businesses and universities in, in Japan have been really disrupted by the, the concept of, oh, let's work at home. Uh, so I think that from a national point of view, that would be one of the more striking things. Um, I think um, everyone has begun this and now is, as was discussed earlier, thinking about, well, wait, how long does this last and what happens later? So that the, the real problems haven't quite started yet, I would say. Thanks, David. Well, thank you very much, uh, Bob. And now uh, I'd like to turn it over to uh, Dr. Stanley uh, and hear uh, how things are going at uh, SMU. Well, it's a very quiet campus uh, these days, and the reduced student population uh, parallels in many ways what uh, President Benson has mentioned, and, and uh, we've talked in terms of different things. I'd like to highlight, rather than simply going through the list of what the university needed to do, because in many ways, it's, as uh, Bob said, it's, it's a general solar path. We moved uh, commencement, postponed it from May 16th until August 15th in the hopes that by then an in-person commencement might be a possibility because of the importance of that to the SMU mm -hmm. community uh, writ large. We've done several other steps that um, could be mentioned in terms of a hiring delay until the end of the year, until December 2020, and taken other uh, steps to address the financial stress that the pandemic will impose uh, on university operations. There are other items in the list, but I think uh, they've been covered by the other two panelists. So in the interest of time, back to you, David. Great. Well, thank you so much. Uh, I want to encourage uh, all the participants, we have uh, around 200 who are with us right now, to uh, write their questions in the Q&A section. We've had some come in. I will be weaving those into the conversation. Uh, but I, uh, there's one question that I wanted to pose to some of the panelists uh, before we get into some more specifics about the situation and how it might impact your university. And um, this one is a bit uh, perhaps uh, philosophical, but uh, what is the role of higher education uh, in crisis situations like this? Um, and could you give some examples if you think that uh, your institution should play a role in outreach to your local community, in, in research around COVID-19? Um, give us a little bit of sense of what your university is uh, doing. And uh, Harold, I thought maybe I'd, I'd uh, just turn it right back to you for a second. Um, you know, maybe you could give us a sense of uh, your own thoughts about that in general and maybe some specifics. 
Thanks. I think definitely the role of the university is one that is multifaceted depending upon the particular university and the array of elements uh, within that university. Um, I think one of the more important things that I'd like to stress is modeling appropriate institutional behavior for the larger community. I think it's critically important that the university communicate, communicate well with that broader community, which is not simply the university community, although that's more than just the faculty, staff, and students. It's alumni as well as supporters, and then the neighboring uh, community as well. So it's very important that lines of communication of what's being done and why and the attention to the health of everyone, everyone all of those are critically important uh, aspects of things. I think it's also important, it's sort of a flip back to the Boy Scout motto of be prepared, and that is you know, a very important lesson that can be learned for institutions like this is it's all the more critical to have in place emergency operations procedures. We have an emergency operations center, which uh, every Monday, Wednesday, Friday, 35 individuals from across the university, sometimes more, spend an hour or more if needed to assess the situation and to respond to what seem to be almost daily changes in the context within which the university must operate. So those are a few of the thoughts on the role higher education could, could play, but certainly, a university with a medical facility might have a very different uh, take on, on what role could be performed. Absolutely. Um, Richard, I uh, wonder uh, if you wanted to jump in here and, and offer some thoughts. Uh, yes. Uh, again, I find a lot of overlap with SMU in, in terms of what we're doing. Uh, maybe something a, a bit more specific. Um, um, we have a very sizable effort in biomedical engineering and science. Um, some of this work, in fact, a lot of the work is done with one of the, the sister schools in the UT system, which is uh, 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 Southwestern, uh, University of Texas Southwestern, which is a great medical school. So we do a lot of work there. In fact, we have a sizable portion of our campus is actually located down um, either adjacent to or on their campus. So We've been working in areas of biomedical engineering and, and science for, for quite some time. I would dare say it's the fastest growing part of our uh, research portfolio. Hmm. So it, as we started to close down some of our own work, it uh, turns out we had a lot of uh, personal protective gear, PPE. Um, and so we made donations, uh, in fact, to UT Southwestern, to Parkland Hospital, which maybe you've heard of, Methodist Richardson, uh, here in our backyard. I mean, I mean a lot of equipment. Um, uh, so. Uh, you know, different masks, uh, gloves, uh, protective gear, and, and the like. And it was very, you know, greatly welcomed by, by folks, especially when uh, many of these supplies were in, in, in short supply. We've done other things. We have some pretty, pretty clever engineers. We do a lot of 3D printing, uh, rapid prototyping, if you will. And so one of our uh, research teams was able to create uh, a valve attachment through 3D printing, which can turn just a, an ordinary snorkel mask into, uh, into protective equipment, safety gear that can be used in a hospital. So uh, th that was also, you know, very well received. We've been doing other things. Um, you know, we have what we call the Comet Cupboard. Uh, our nickname is the Comets. But, uh, you know, we're gathering food for students in need. We have a, a, a lot of students who may be hungry. Uh, we've created an emergency fund um, and, and have received a great many, uh, you know, private donations to, uh, to that fund, uh, again, to give to students who maybe lost, lost a, a job um, and the like and, and need some help. Uh, and we have an army of people who are sewing cloth masks right now, including my wife. And so as we, as we crank out the cloth masks, we give them away uh, as fast as we can. So these are just some of the areas where we've used uh, the assets of the university to 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 try to help with this uh, with this crisis, and thank you very much. And Bob, I know in Okinawa, uh, OIST is also doing some uh, outreach to the local community. Um, I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about uh, that. And um, the other question I had, which which I wonder if you could go into a little bit, uh, and it was alluded to earlier. Uh, Richard actually mentioned. Uh, that despite the fact that everyone is uh, kind of separated and working from home, uh, there's a lot of research to still be done. And one of the questions I had um, uh, after you tell us a little bit about the way in which OIST is working with the community is how is an institution like OIST, which is so far away from a lot of places, um, 
still conducting research globally? How is it still working with international partners? So I wonder if I could turn those two questions to you, uh, Bob. Yeah, thank you, David. But to start with the last one first, it's amazing what you can do on the internet these days. Mm. And that's that. I'll, I'll wrap up my answer there. That's the way we're interacting with the rest of the world. This event that we're on right now is an example of that. And in some ways, it's amazing how little interruption there is. Uh, uh, to go back to the, the general issue of uh, role of the university, I, I think one very important role that was alluded to earlier is the idea of uh, uh, the institutional behavior uh, uh, of that one would expect in society. And one of the risks is that in situations like this, there's oscillation, there are oscillations of behavior. And I think universities actually are one rather important part to say, no, 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 let's keep this thing on course. And, and we've tried to do that through uh, informed news articles, op-ed type things and so forth. Uh, and I think that actually is a very important role uh, in every country for the universities. In terms of our relationships with the local community, uh, uh, there are uh, several projects that, uh, that have made a, quite a big impact. One is all a, a type of thing that's been referred to earlier, PPE. We've made uh, 800 uh, 3D printed uh, face shields, not masks, shields. Uh, that were really needed here and they've been distributed uh, into the hospitals on the island. Um, and uh, another one is uh, a steriliz sterilization, alcohol-based gels, uh, which uh, are now in very short supply. And, uh, and in both of those cases, and let me add one more. One thing, we're a research university. We know how to do polymerase chain reaction, PCR. We can do that. And so the question is, okay, is there any way we can get our skills and equipment uh, in touch with the clinical environment quickly and efficiently? And we, we've been able to do that. We're not operating yet, but we, we have that uh, set up with the prefecture and we expect to be operating in a short period of time. And it's clear our capacity really will help in Okinawa. So that's another area. But we're also working on the, the front end of uh, research with respect to developing uh, new micro devices uh, for kind of nanofluidic analysis in the field uh, based on uh, uh, capabilities that otherwise exist and also developing new post exposure monitoring uh, based broadly speaking on antibodies and other things. So we have a variety of things going. And I'll finish with one kind of cute one, which is definitely, uh, in a way, new intellectual property, which we then chose not to protect at all. And that is how to make the, the critical material, the base material of an N95 mask with a cotton candy machine. And it turns out when you know how you make an N95 mask, you get it right away. You have a very expensive device. There's nothing but a cotton candy machine. And you put stuff in and you heat it up and it spins and you have your N95. And so we, we one of our faculty members, uh, who's from India actually, said in much of the world, they don't have all that ex expensive equipment, but they have a lot of cotton candy machines. And so that's now been, uh, it's open and it's being developed in uh, about 60, 70 places. So those would be some examples. Uh, in ways that we've tried to uh, work uh, both locally and uh, uh, more broadly with this. Thanks, David. Well, that's an interesting uh, insight. I think, you know, we'll find a lot of intriguing innovations coming out of this. I would like to turn the next, uh, there are a number of questions coming in from the audience, and I, I'd like to uh, uh, ask two of them that are on the same theme uh, and turn it first to Harold and then to Richard. Uh, and these both have to do, and a number of other questions also have to do with uh, the adoption of technology and moving uh, into online education. I think this is something that uh, everyone has an interest in. Here we are on a Zoom call after all. Uh, and, and there's a little bit of texture with both of these questions. So I'll read them both, I'll turn them over to you, Harold, uh, and, and then uh, ask Richard um, to jump in. Um, the first one, and uh, since these were not written anonymously, I will read the names from John Stitch, is says, 
will COVID-19 result in a permanent change with more online education at your institution? Uh, and what financial impact will this have? So the question isn't only uh, uh, in the short term moving online, but what about the long term? And a related question by uh, Stephen Masaki is, uh, if online learning continues for the foreseeable future, how do universities differentiate themselves from each other? Um, kind of interesting twist. So I wonder, Harold, if you might share your comments on uh, what do you think the long-term uh, implications are here in terms of using technology? Uh, uh, do you think you'll continue to do that or, or will it revert back to uh, more traditional classes? And the short answer is to the three questions that were the textured questions, as you put it, is that more online education? Yes. What will the financial implications be? to be determined, and what will be the, how will highly competitive academic institutions differentiate themselves? And I think the quality of the online teaching will be an important matter. SMU was preparing to move more into the online space through continuing education. And this, of course, the pandemic caused a crash course in online education that familiarized faculty who weren't necessarily inclined to uh, get more acquainted with both the strengths and the limitations of online. Online education is more, quality online education is something more than turning a camera on and recording what happens in the classroom. Mm. And it's critically important that now that we've had this um, forced uh, introduction, if you will, into the online world, it's important that we work on improving and getting even better. The experience overall, which we had in like UTD, was one in which it really had not been anticipated at the beginning of the semester that this was going to happen in the middle of the semester. So it all went surprisingly well. I teach a co-teach a course on global policymaking. And the seven students took to the online environment like a duck to water. Hmm. But highly motivated students. It's a discussion-based format. So in a way, it was ideally suited to the online environment. So I think that one of the upshots about, yes, there'll be more online, but in a sense, even the in-person classes will probably have more elements of online. Mm. The faculty who've previously taught in the online environment come back and say, I'll never teach in person the same way again. So what I've learned about teaching through online informs my in-person classes as well. So the hybrid class is simply the uh, in-person combined with some elements of online. That's very interesting, uh, ways in which uh, technology and uh, more traditional perhaps methods of teaching could be combined into the future. And Richard, uh, uh, what are your thoughts on these topics? Uh, do you see online education becoming a long-term uh, component of uh, what's uh, going on at University of Texas at Dallas? Um, yes, a, a great, great question. In fact, I've been thinking about this, this very topic for, for, for quite some time. You all remember when the massive open online course, courses appeared on the scene or MOOCs, uh, a lot of us were thinking very hard as to what this does to the future of higher education. And I'll come back to that. Um, more locally, you know, when, when, when this crisis hit, I think if you were to ask me or any other, any other president, how long would it take for your faculty to transition completely to an online format? And you might say, it might take two years. Um, and we'd have a lot of people dragging their feet, <laughs> kicking and screaming. And, um, but you know, the fact is we did it in two weeks. We did it in two weeks and we've done it very, very well. In fact, uh, I, I, I've hardly heard a complaint from anybody. Uh, I think everyone sort of understands that it's just something that was needed. So the, the faculty did it. I think they uh, surprised themselves, uh, you know, some of them, in fact, at, at how, you know, how rewarding it could be and some of the things that they could do that maybe they couldn't do just standing in front of a, you know, a, a chalkboard. Um, so we have a, a number of notable ex examples. We had a theater class, for example, which, uh, you know, would conclude their semester with a, with, a, with a production, but they switched that to an online radio play instead. So <laughs> I, I thought that the class uh, responded in, in a pretty clever way. As I mentioned before, uh, you know, we're talking about various phases, including a, a post-vaccine phase, in other words, the new normal. And I think that's at the essence of your question, which is, you know, what will it be like? Clearly, we'll have a far greater use of pedagogical technology. 
Um, and in fact, we would want to do that anyway. Hmm. Uh, there are so many things that you can do, you know, with the aid uh, of, of powerful computers and, and, and broad networks. You can connect to audiences that you otherwise couldn't have had. You could do interesting things. Uh, I think back to my, my penultimate job at, at Virginia Tech. One of my favorite classes was offered simultaneously in four countries, you know, at Virginia Tech, Howard University, uh, Monterey Tech in Mexico, uh, TU Darmstadt in, in, in Germany, and Shanghai Jiatong. Uh, in China. It was an engineering course, but it was just uh, a, a marvelous use of the technology. The students worked together on design teams, and I don't mean just the Mexican team and, and the Chinese team. I mean, they were blended, and and I actually attended class from three of those locations, um, and it, it was just a great way of using technology to, to reach uh, additional audiences, to be able to cover the material uh, in a more robust way. So clearly, we will be doing that. I'm a big fan of uh, of, of, of uh, blended classes, if, if you will, blended technology and the like. Uh, sometimes an asynchronous uh, presentation can be very advantageous. Uh, so you, you enable the students to see the lecture whenever. Uh, and, and if they're living half a world away, that can be an important thing. Uh, but again, it, you still want to have uh, the interaction in, in other ways. Now, if I may add just one other word here. Uh, this is a thought experiment. It goes back to my MOOC days. And we, we can't just take what we do, the thing that makes uh, SMU different from UT Dallas, different from you know, some other fine university. And that is the, 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 uh, the on-campus environment. It, it is the, the experience you have working with, with your, with your uh, fellow classmates, with your teachers. A thought experiment I like to give to people is, we know that everyone here got a terrific education somewhere. Maybe, maybe you've even heard of some of those schools like Harvard and, and Yale. And I would ask my colleagues, what would be the value of that education if all you had was the time in class? If, if it was only the time you sat in the class uh, with some wise person in front of you lecturing to you, what if you took away all the stuff you did outside of the classroom, working maybe in a team with, with other students, maybe uh, suffering through some god awful you know, a final exam or, or a project, but also what about uh, the enjoyment that you had? Maybe you played music, maybe you played sports. Uh, just you know the learning that goes on student to student uh, outside the classroom. This is what a, a great university fosters, and it is so much of the educational experience. So I don't ever foresee the time when a completely online format can can replace that. So again, I, I'm an engineer. I, I love pedagogical technology. I'll use it to, to the maximum, but we know that uh, we we really need to get back to the on-campus presence. It is just so vital to what we do. Uh, you know, we wanted it for ourselves. I wanted it for my own children. Uh, we, we, as I say, we, we need to get back to that. We'll use the technology, but we have to get back to the residential mode. Well, thank you for that, Rich. I, I couldn't agree with you more. <laughs> um, so I, I think that's a fabulous insight. Um, Richard, I wanted to ask you a, a related question, um, which, uh, you know, if, if Bob or Harold want to jump in uh, on as well, I'd, I'd be curious about. But um, there are uh, aspects of uh, university research that might be challenging right now. So obviously, there's a lot that can continue. There are certain kinds of classes you can teach remotely. Uh, there's certain kinds of research you can do. Uh, but I'm particularly curious about um, uh, research that requires one to be in a lab. Uh, ha, ha, could you just give us a sense of, is that pause now or, or are certain labs open uh, on campus? Um, well, we're fighting through this. And if you rem remember my fa three phases, we have to find a way to get back into those labs because it, it's absolutely true. There are some things, you know, we, we've collected the data, we can write it up. We're, we're still writing proposals. Um, and, and the like, but some of that research, and I would dare say a lot of the research requires that you be, you, you be present somewhere. Maybe, you, you know, you're working with, um, you know, animals and, and the like, or, or just uh, specialized equipment. You just simply have to be there. Um, we are looking very carefully at how to reopen those labs in, in a phase two mode. So um, if you think about opening a business, I've been on any number of calls where people have talked about opening a business. And if you have, a, say, a single point of entry, uh, you can do things. You can take the temperature of everybody walking through the door. You can make sure they're wearing a face mask and so on. Uh, but a college campus doesn't allow for that. I mean, we have tens of thousands 
of people who come on our, our campus every day through you know several dozen different access points. However, in some of our research labs, uh, including highly specialized ones, you may have six people who work in their lab. And indeed, they, they do have a single point of entry. And there are things that you could do. Maybe you, you stagger uh, the teams that come in. So not everybody is there at the same time, but they might come in you know, through shifts. Uh, and so we are working very hard. And in fact, I think the reopening of our labs, and I mean all of our labs to some extent, will be in the vanguard of what we do to get back into business. So we will be able to relaunch our research uh, a lot sooner than we can uh, relaunch a, a lot of the classroom uh, activity. Uh, so, and, and, and for what it's worth, uh, the University of California system has been doing some, some good work in this regard. So I, I would uh, you know, uh, refer you to say UC Berkeley and others to see mm -hmm. how they're going about trying to relaunch uh, their research activity. So, uh, we're, we're trying to get an early start uh, on that, and we think we can do it, and we can still keep um, the people in those labs safe. So, uh, you know, watch for that. Right. And thank you very much. And Bob, you, you alluded to this earlier, so, uh, but I did want to give you a chance, since OIST is a graduate university uh, that has a, a significant number of people working in labs, uh, I wanted to see if you wanted to jump in and, and make any particular comments. Yeah, sure, David. So I think on the, the first point I mentioned earlier, that we quickly looked at ongoing experiments and assessed, identified those that would be, uh, create a really serious problem if they were interrupted. By their nature, they, they can't be interrupted. <clears throat> and we've made special arrangements so that, um, partly the, the idea of shift work and having people coming and going, that these could be continued. And then, uh, in addition, I think uh, we need to plan for uh, the, the reintroduction. And I think uh, that one of the things is that the way we're going to be doing the experiments will be, will be different, actually, so that there, have been, there will be several, many, unintended consequences of this exercise. And, and one of them will be, actually, we could do experiments, broadly speaking, in different ways. And I think there will be some profound changes that will be lasting there as well. Uh, so I think from, from that point of view, the, not all experiments are the same. Some experiments, you could just do them next week instead of this week. Other experiments, you'd have to do them four years from now if you don't keep them going. And so that's, broadly speaking, that's been a very important thing, I think, to consider. Um, jumping back just briefly to the, the idea of, wait a minute, do, we ever, do these people ever need to be on campus at all? And so I, I think, uh, speaking personally, and then looking at all of my colleagues, uh, I find that the group of friends, colleagues, contacts, that we develop during the years of roughly speaking undergraduate and graduate education go on to become a kind of underlying group of, of, of trusted personal contacts for the rest of our lives. And I think that can't be done without spending actual time together. And so I, w I really wanted to support that idea. I don't think that what we're doing at the moment here online can ever completely replace, absolutely can't completely replace, replace the, the social experience of the campus. So th those would be uh, comments I'd make about that. We have a number of questions coming in, and I think in a moment or two, I might uh, do a kind of rapid fire of some of them. But uh, one question that has come in from Matthew Sussman, who is dialing in from Tokyo, uh, relates to a sort of US-Japan connection. And I, I wondered if uh, you know we might turn our attention to that for a moment. Uh, he's wondering if there are any examples of existing online classes or connections uh, with American and Japanese universities, ways in which the U.S. and, and, and Japanese universities might connect together online, uh, or if perhaps you have examples, uh, Richard, I think already mentioned some examples of sort of global uh, education techniques. But Harold, I know uh, at SMU you have a, a very vibrant uh, Japan studies program, and I wonder if uh, you have any particular connections with Japanese universities and, and uh, if you're thinking of doing anything um, in an online platform with them? In the online space, I'm not aware that that 
underway, but certainly, and apologies for the pronunciation, but Kwansai Gwekin is a university that going back to the 1980s, SMU has been very closely affiliate, affiliated with. That relationship has oscillated a bit over the years, but uh, given the uh, involvement of the Tower Center, that aspect of study abroad has been reinvigorated. But that was the in-person experience, which I agree with every comment my fellow panelists have made about the very important aspect of being able to acquire and to get an education in a residential fashion. And we all hope that we can return to that more broadly. But in short, the online development in the future, I think it's definitely a prospect and a potential for working with this established relationship. It's interesting to note that a number of questions coming in uh, uh, related to online education from Japan are making, uh, they're, they're prefacing their questions with the statement that uh, Japanese universities uh, don't have uh, sometimes uh, as significant internet connections or online capabilities. So uh, just a fascinating data point. It resonates with uh, Bob, what you had. Uh, said earlier. Uh, there are uh, several questions here related to um, students. And uh, in particular, uh, I'm just going to sort of wrap some of these questions together. Uh, the questions revolve around the fact that graduating students are uh, now moving into a workforce where uh, there may be very limited number of positions. Uh, the economy uh, is obviously quite stressed, uh, and people are sort of looking for advice. <laughs> so I, I wonder, uh, uh, maybe Richard, I'll, I'll turn it to you for a moment. You know, um, you have a number of graduating seniors uh, on your campus, uh, and and uh, presumably some of them are, are tuning in here. Uh, what what would you like to say to them uh, as they move into this uh, bit uncertain uh, state of the world? Sure, I'd be glad to. So to uh, any UT Dallas students, uh, whoosh, um, say, say, say hi to my students. Um, you know, it, it was mentioned before about what people are doing for commencement. I'll just briefly say that we're going to have a virtual commencement. I've recorded uh, a bit. Uh, the provost and all of the deans have uh, recorded uh, their, their, their good wishes. Uh, we have kind of a, a nice little package of, of, of stuff that we're going to send to each of our graduating seniors. And when the time finally comes, uh, they will be invited to walk across the stage and receive their diplomas in, in the normal fashion. Uh, right now, we're, we're looking at, uh, you know, the winter uh, commencement. Uh, so, you know, half a year, half a year away, but we absolutely want to give them that opportunity. You know, the job prospects are tough and we don't control that. Um, so, so many, so many companies have been uh, either shuttered or they're working at just, uh, you know, a, a very low level. So uh, job prospects are not good right now, and unemployment uh, is, is skyrocketing in the U.S. Uh, it's a tough time to be a, a, a graduating senior. Um, I, I'm sure all of the panelists uh, can speak with pride of, of the sort of education that we provide to our students. So uh, in, in years past, our students have been in very high demand. In fact, we, we have a great many students that roughly close to 90 percent are, are either in the STEM disciplines or in management. And again, areas that are in very high demand. But it, it could be a while uh, before they can land that job. And for others, the, the summer job has gone away. What we're seeing is that our enrollment for our summer session classes is uh, reaching record levels. <laughs> We've moved all of those courses online. So you know, the entire presentation will be online. And we were sort of wondering what might happen. But what we're seeing is a lot of students are making the decision this would be an ideal time to maybe get a, a, a bit of a head start on their studies or maybe to start to transition into a master's degree and the like. Um, so it's, it's a little hard to see how that'll play out, but um, you know, given how tough the economy is right now, uh, it, it can be a pretty good choice uh, to just uh, to, to continue your education and, and to add some other skills uh, to your arsenal. So we're, we're seeing that. Don't know what it'll mean for the fall, but, but as I say, our summer enrollment is substantially ahead of, of prior years. Thank you. Harold, uh, how about uh, a message that you might want to give to uh, graduating seniors at SMU or, or at any other institution? Well, it certainly has been a very trying year that none of us exactly signed up for. And the importance of the marking of the moment, the rather abrupt way that seniors were 
essentially ending their residential experience uh, on campus. All of this is something that, that leads us to hope for a situation in which we can have that in-person commencement in the middle of August before the start of the fall term. Time will tell. We'll see uh, what conditions and circumstances are like then. I think that the education that's provided by the three institutions represented here is one that, as, as Dick said, we all take great pride in what's provided. These students go forth with the brand of that education and, and what that means, as well as connecting with an alumni base and the various other corporate connections and what have you. And so consequently, as a result, it may not be come May, June, July, exactly the prospects that you were hoping for, but in the fullness of time, one hopes and expects as we return to that situation when this is behind us, that it will be a uh, far, far better situation for these graduating seniors. Mm. And Bob, OIST is in a, 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 a bit of a different situation in the sense that it's graduate students only, but uh, obviously OIST also has uh, students going out into the workforce, whether they're uh, going to, on to uh, postdoc or uh, into business. I, I, I wonder, similar question to you, um, you know, what message you might send to them, uh, or more broadly, just to any students that are tuning into this uh, who are uh, transitioning into the workforce, uh, words of advice. Yeah, thanks, David. Uh, one comment that I would make having, shall we say, having been around a while, is this is not the first time hmm. that something like this has happened, certainly in my personal uh, life. And there have been many downturns and upswings across disciplines in the areas that are represented in universities. Sometimes the life sciences are just doing great. Other times, that's the worst thing you could possibly be in. Uh, literature, up, down, mathematics, up, down. And <clears throat> so my uh, arguably strongest personal, and I would also try to make it an institutional uh, type of advice, is think very carefully what you as an individual are good at, what you would like to do for the rest of your life, very broadly speaking. And then focus on that. Do not get distracted into something that you know doesn't actually fit uh, your personality, your interests as well. Having said that, I think these days it's very important to take advantages of the opportunity to broaden your own personal experience given this focus, so that you have some focus, you're going to do whatever it is, and to then take advantage of, uh, and this is where the online training is, is, is tremendously valuable, opportunities to uh, learn more about how a scientist could work in industry. How could a scientist work with the government or the, or the, the uh, 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 overall uh, uh, public sector. And so uh, to me, it's a tremendous opportunity here for young people, given please focus on what you want to do in the end. Thank you for that. Um, there is a uh, question from a student that um, I, I, I'm going to turn into a larger question and, and address to Harold first. Uh, but it has to do with a question that a number of people in the audience have, which is the impact of the COVID-19 situation on finances at higher education. There are a number of questions here about um, <coughs> fees, will, will fees be reduced, things like that. But, but here's a specific question uh, from uh, uh, Heiwan Kim, who says, I'm currently an MA student at Columbia University planning to apply for a PhD at the end of this year. I wonder if there is, are going to be any budget cuts for funding for PhD students or reducing the number of PhD students to ad, uh, be admitted. Uh, and there are a number of similar kinds of questions that relate to uh, the budget of universities and how it will impact. Uh, and I, I guess, uh, you know, just in a quick broad sense, Harold, uh, we all know this is going to have an impact, but how serious is this impact on SMU? Well, it's certainly a very uh, serious undertaking in terms of the shortfalls in revenue, the refunds that were occasioned by residential food contracts not being ones that were fully exercised this semester. Looking ahead, if you could tell me what enrollment is going to be like in the fall, then I'll be able to answer many of the questions about um, 
the, the likely financial repercussions that this might have. SMU as an institution is one that is 70% tuition in terms of its operating budget. Mm -hmm. Enrollment is vitally important. And consequently, we won't know until several months from now what the fall will look like. And then the question is, if we're not in Dick's phase three, what is the spring semester going to look like? And, and so on from there. So I think universities are ones that are going to be looking very carefully at the revenue shortfalls that may result from this, as well as what are the expenses that can be held down and mm -hmm. managed much more effectively. But it'd be very premature to start speculating. I, I would think that a lot of things may be on the table, but we're all hoping for a much more optimistic outcome than some of the more draconian ones. But, Thank you. I'd like to give Richard a, a sense to, to jump in here if he'd like. And then um, we're, we're uh, rapidly coming to a close, although there's so much more we want to discuss. So I, I have one final question for all the panelists. But Richard, let me turn it over to you for a moment. Yeah, well, I'll try to be brief. Uh, you, you know, we're going to take quite the financial hit, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry to say. Uh, as a state institution, you know, we have two segments to our operating budget. Actually, you know, the, the amount that we get from the state of Texas is, is only 17% of our overall uh, budget. So, um, but nevertheless, there, there's, it's pretty, pretty well understood that Texas will probably have a, a clawback, so to speak, of, of some amount uh, for the coming fiscal year. I've heard 5%, 10%, and we'll see. Uh, but uh, not unlike uh, SMU, which is, is a, a private university, a substantial fraction of our budget comes from tuition. So the fall enrollment is, is critically important to us. We have a very sizable international population. And in fact, uh, we have more uh, international students at UT Dallas than any other university in Texas, which is saying something because you know, some of those schools are enormous. But again, we have a great many students from India and China and other parts uh, of the world. So we have the added problem that uh, they, they have applied, they've been admitted, they want to come, but they may not be able to come. Um, so we're looking for ways that we can engage them, including uh, having them connect with us this summer through our summer offerings. And it's also why in the fall, regardless of whether we're back on the campus or not, we're going to have a substantial amount which is being uh, delivered, uh, you know, through, uh, delivered online. Um, I'm something uh, of an optimist at heart. So I think of my phase two as just needing to tough it out for a year to a year and a half. So I, I'm looking at an 18 month period and, and this is important financially. So whatever the, the shortfall we take, we, we, we kind of know in our heart that it is limited. There will come that vaccine. There will come uh, better medical treatments and we will be able to you know, reopen the economy as, as, as people have, have talked about. And we should be able to get back uh, to our, 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 norm or, our normal or perhaps our new normal. And I like to point out that going into this crisis, UT Dallas was very strong, um, and we we will remain strong. Uh, so again, we're going to have to we're going to have to do some tough things. No one's going to get a raise this coming year. We're not uh, offering new new hires. Uh, I'm not. We're not making new hires unless it's absolutely critical. We're deferring a lot of maintenance. We're looking for every way that we possibly can to save expense until we can get into that that phase three when when things will take a turn for the better. Well, thank you very much for that. Before I turn it over to Paul uh, for, for final closing remarks, um, I'd like to do two things. First, I, I just really want to thank uh, uh, Bob, Harold, and Richard for being with us and, and sharing uh, these really uh, wonderful insights. And I'd, I'd like to give each of you a, a chance to uh, say a final word or two, but here's a, a possible question um, for you to consider. Um, and it goes far beyond higher education. Uh, I think, you know, probably everyone listening here tonight is looking for um, some sense of, of hope, encouragement. Uh, and I think all of you as uh, clear leaders in the world, uh, you've been through your own ups and downs in life, and yet uh, you've persevered and continued on. Uh, so I wonder, uh, and maybe I'll, I'll, I'll go Bob, Harold, Richard in that order, uh, I wonder if you have any uh, words for the general audience about, um, you know, marching on in the face of adversity uh, that you might offer, uh, and any just general quick closing remarks, and then uh, I'll turn it over to you, Paul. So, Bob. General remarks. Uh, we, we must 
move on. We, the universities, uh, we have no choice. Uh, the way we do things may change, but we, we've got to move on. I think that, however, things will never be the same. Mm -hmm. They really never will be the same now. And that includes something about online. It has something to do with budgets and so on. Uh, we will survive. And uh, I think uh, the one thing that hasn't come up much in this discussion that I am quite concerned about is a possible uh, reversal, which we as universities, I think, have to fight against. Reversal of the internationalization of the world, which was coming along rather well. And I see that being reversed with a kind of rapidity that makes me very nervous uh, and is being uh, exacerbated by the current situation. So I, that would be another kind of closing remark that I think it's important for us to, in whatever way we can, to continue to maintain. That's the whole principle of this OIST and, and the other universities here as well now that uh, to maintain the uh, connections and support the importance of uh, the international relationships. Thank you very much, Bob. And that resonates certainly with uh, remarks that Harold and Richard both uh, made earlier too about uh, international classes and courses. So I, I appreciate that very much. Thank you, Harold. Briefly, the um, higher education can be extremely competitive. But I think that the working through this together will be critically important. Dick made reference to conversations he and I had, it seems like years ago, but it was actually only maybe a month or two, and about this whole uh, situation. What has really struck me is the very talented and dedicated individuals who have faced this unbelievable situation and the can-do spirit that they've exhilarated, uh, exhibited. It's exhilarating. It's also the case that the students have shown a degree of resilience, which I didn't fully credit them for. And they have, in a sense, triumphed and hopefully will prevail. And I'd like to say, as, as President Turner echoing some of his uh, comments made, and to remind us that what we do as a university is important for the future of humanity. And work that we do is valued. And at this time in particular, our students depend on us to help us help them achieve their dreams as they seek to navigate this challenging time. So I'd like to be somewhat of the optimist that, that Dick professed to be uh, facing the future. Thank you very much, Harold. And uh, uh, sir, last but certainly not least, uh, uh, Richard, well, uh, thank you. Um, you know, I, I have great confidence we will get through this. Um, um, triggered by something that uh, Robert said, uh, you know, I have faced adversity before. I was the Dean of Engineering at Virginia Tech when tragedy hit there. And I, and I saw what it took to, to bring that organization back to strength, uh, which it did. And uh, this also echoes some things uh, from Harold, but uh, words like resilience. And I might also point out to the fact that it, it isn't just the faculty and the staff that will, will bring us you know, to, to the new normal, but our students will be vital uh, to this. So, um, you know, as I mentioned just a minute ago, <clears throat> UT Dallas was strong coming into this. Uh, we're gonna take some blows, but by God, you know, we will get through this. Uh, we, we know that we have the faculty, staff and students and friends, uh, friends out in the community uh, who will support us. So uh, I have every confidence in the world uh, that we will we will weather this storm. Well, the three of you have certainly uh, inspired confidence in me, and I'm sure in all of the people attending the webinar tonight. I once again uh, want to extend a, a great appreciation. I know the three of you are extremely busy, uh, and we thank you very much. And uh, without further ado, uh, I will turn it over to Paul for closing remarks. Thank you, Paul. Okay. Well, thank you so much, David. Um, and thank you to all of our panelists for their insights in a challenging time for their institutions. We greatly appreciate both their time and their willingness to share. We would also like to express our gratitude to everyone who attended this program this evening or this morning, for those of you in Japan, and for your eagerness to explore the US-Japan relationship. We kindly ask that you complete the post-event survey that we have shared in the chat box. So there's a link to a Google 
form. Uh, if you're unable to view this or access that survey, we will share it again through an email, most likely coming through tomorrow. If you enjoy programming like this, we ask that you consider making a donation to the Japan America Society of Dallas-Fort Worth and the OIST Foundation. Information on how to give is in the chat box and will also be included on the upcoming email. At the Japan America Society, we are working on more online programs for May. Therefore, please check our website at www.jasdfw.org or subscribe to our newsletter for updates. We also ask that you save the date for Wednesday, May 27th at 6.30 p.m. Dallas time for our 2020 annual meeting, which will also include special remarks by the Honorable Hideo Fukushima, Consul General of Japan in Houston. Thank you for attending and have a wonderful rest of your evening or morning.